chapter fourteen of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter fourteen expulsion from eden you took my heart and made it beat then trampled it beneath your feet and watched its cracks and creases unless i make a great mistake a heart thus hurt was bound to break so say no more for pity's sake but sweep up all the pieces when the season was at its height it unfortunately happened that isabel's evil genius made the suggestion that paul was growing too headstrong and masterful and prescribed a good dose of jealousy as a cure for this complaint of course isabel should have known better than to listen to such dangerous promptings and should forthwith have silenced the lying spirit by her faith in her lover and in his love for her but no mortal is wise at all times not even when the mortal happens to be a woman and this was a time of unwisdom on isabel's part paul is too sure of your love whispered isabel's evil genius now that you are always nice to him he takes your niceness as a matter of course paul is right to be sure of my love replied isabel's better self it is a poor trick to try to enhance the value of anything by pretending that its existence is precarious there is no good in having power if you never use it argued the evil genius there is no good in having love if you ever abuse it answered the better self paul is not nearly as fond of you as he was at first paul loves me as much as ever and it is a shame to doubt him if he is as fond of you as he was why has he ceased to look black when you speak to another man because he knows that i love him and he trusts me then the evil genius whispered do you think it would be possible to make him as jealous as he used to be i am sure it would but nothing would induce me to try still it would be an interesting experiment just to see for certain if he does love you as much as ever suggested the evil genius this argument in isabel's inner consciousness continued for several days and the result of it was that at a dance at the gordons isabel flirted outrageously with mr matterley paul took it very well at first he had perfect confidence in isabel and he knew that it does not do to pull the reins too tight isabel noticed that he took it very well and put his endurance down to indifference consequently she flirted harder than ever by an almost superhuman effort paul refrained from saying a word to isabel on the subject and succeeded in being quite kind and courteous when he bade her good-night though he was in a fury of jealous misery underneath his calm exterior isabel felt certain that such calmness showed that he did not care and cried herself to sleep that night paul argued that he owed it to isabel to conceal his anguish isabel argued that he owed it to her to reveal it paul knew that you do not talk about a thing if it really hurts you isabel knew that if a thing really hurts you you cannot talk about anything else all through the following day this wretched state of things continued paul was pale and quiet and longed to throw himself into the serpentine isabel was flushed and brilliant and talked to lord wrexham and mr matterley in the row paul hoped that he might be kept from kicking lord wrexham and mr matterley isabel prayed that she might be kept from crying until she reached home 
isabel thought that there was nothing in the world that mattered except love but felt she would die sooner than let paul see how much she cared for him paul thought that there was nothing in the world that mattered except isabel but couldn't for the life of him imagine what had come to her isabel decided that the only dignified course was to let paul think she had ceased to love him paul decided that the only honourable course was to give isabel her freedom that night isabel again cried herself to sleep and paul never went to sleep at all the next morning they both felt better and repaired to kensington gardens on the chance of a meeting each was in a more reasonable and amiable frame of mind and quite prepared to forgive the other if that other made as adequate show of penitence it was unfortunate however that neither had studied the part of the one to be forgiven paul made up his mind that he would be patient with isabel and would not lose his temper however provoking she might be so he began quite gently after the customary greetings look here isabel i don't want to say anything nasty because nasty words always leave a scar behind but i wish you would not go on in the way you have done just lately it isn't fair to me but that is of small consequence what really matters is that it isn't fair to yourself for it makes people say horrid things about you and that is the one thing that i cannot and will not bear isabel looked surprised this was a funny beginning for a penitential confession i don't know what you mean oh yes you do dear said paul patiently isabel was annoyed she did not like being called over the coals as if she were a tiresome schoolgirl oh no i don't and anyhow i don't flirt worse than half the women in london that is nothing to do with me isabel i don't care a hang how much other women are talked about i only care for what people say of you believe me i am not blaming you dear blaming me i should think not exclaimed isabel angrily how could any self-respecting woman forgive a man who talked about not blaming her i only want to save you from doing things in a moment of temper that i know you will regret afterwards added paul isabel's face flushed i can take care of myself thank you i knew how to behave even before i had the inestimable privilege of learning manners from mr paul seaton still paul kept his temper you know darling you have been awfully rough on me the last few days but i'll forgive you like a shot and never say another word about it if you will promise not to go on like that again thank you said isabel pertly i notice that as long as a clever woman is content to sit at a man's feet and say this is the only man in the whole world that man thinks he enjoys the society of clever women but if the clever woman happens to indulge in an opinion not implanted by him he calls her unwomanly and he pines for amiable stupidity that is not fair isabel i detest amiable stupidity no you don't you really like it isabel this is absurd and you know it is isabel felt absolutely sure now that paul did not really care an ideal lover would have been in a frenzy of agony at her anger she thought instead of taking it in this calm superior way i suppose you'd like me to be shut up like a turkish woman and never speak to any man but you certainly not but all the same i'm not going to have my promised wife flirting with a lot of other men and i tell you so as i have said before there are some things which a man would sooner renounce than share isabel shrugged her shoulders you really have got a most detestable temper isabel don't for pity's sake go on like this there is nothing in reason that i would not do or bear for you but it is possible to try a man too far 
it strikes me there is precious little that you would do or bear for me in spite of all your talk paul looked very stern do you really mean that by this time isabel had lashed herself into a perfect fury yes i do mean it you are so proud and self-centred that you only care for what enhances your own importance you are pleased to be engaged to a smart woman because it reflects credit on yourself but for the feelings of the woman underneath her smartness you don't care a rap isabel be careful what you say no i shan't be careful i am tired of being careful and of considering your feelings when you never show the slightest consideration for mine you are hard and cold and selfish that is what you are and it is time you knew it you never really loved me you admired me because i was showy and you thought that a showy wife would help you in your career but you never loved me as a woman only as one of the steps by which you could mount to success paul's face was very white how dare you say such things to me because i think them you are precious careful forsooth for fear people should talk about me because you think such talk is in some measure derogatory to you but you are pretty careless as to what you say to me as you know that whatever you say it will be none the worse for yourself you only care for me and my reputation as an adjunct to your own importance if you were a man i should say you lied oh no you wouldn't you dare not say half the nasty things to a man that you say to me if you had been a man i should have silenced you long ago by this time isabel was very angry with herself and consequently ten times angrier with paul so she continued recklessly as long as you only thought i liked the other men better than you you didn't care it was only when you began to think i was bringing discredit on you that you thought it necessary to make such a fuss isabel once for all listen to me paul's voice was so ominously quiet that a wiser woman or even a foolish woman who was not in a temper would have taken warning but isabel possessed the dangerous gift of a vivid imagination and what was once humorously said of faith may be literally said of imagination namely that it makes people believe what they know to be false i won't listen to you and i won't be dictated to you by you she retorted goading herself to still further fury by her own words if you had your own way you would make a perfect slave of me and trample me under foot but i won't stand it isabel you are very cruel and very unjust have you no consideration for my feelings not i why should i when you have none for mine you seem to think that feelings are a sign of exquisite refinement peculiar to yourself and you are so busy seeing that everybody fulfils their duty to you that you have no time to think of your duty to other people we have had enough of this said paul rising from his seat more than enough i should say still i have one question to ask did you mean it when you said that i only cared for you as a stepping-stone to my own success isabel tossed her head of course i meant it you never care for anything or anybody that does not minister to your own pride paul's face was white and his voice shook then i have only one thing to say before i go out of your life altogether i will not profane my love for you by talking about it to a woman who would grow tired of any lover as soon as his novelty had worn off but i wish you to understand that i will neither see you nor speak to you nor hold any communication with you till you ask my forgiveness for having so insulted me and till you retract that cruel untruth which in your heart of hearts you know to be untrue as well as i do isabel drew herself to her full height and her eyes blazed it showed how little paul really loved her she thought that he could give her up so easily then you will never see me nor speak to me again she said for i am not 
the woman to come grovelling to a man for pardon because i once dared to tell him the truth to his face without another word paul turned on his heel and left her and never once looked back as he strode out of kensington gardens he felt that to him in future the place would be a cemetery rather than a garden for there he had buried the one love of his life so paul and isabel passed out of each other's ken simply because the latter had been fool enough to think that a good man's love was a thing to be played with rather than a gift for which to thank heaven fasting there is no doubt that the troubles sent by providence are always beneficial if taken in a proper spirit but the troubles brought on by our own or another's ill-doing are not necessarily salutary at all therefore both paul and isabel were the worse for their separation paul threw himself heart and soul into his work and turned his back upon all the amenities of life he had lost his faith in love and in his old ideals and the loss was not good for him he became morose and hard and cynical and inclined to sneer at higher things his love for isabel had been so bound up with all that was best in him that when isabel failed much of his best went with her at any rate for the time being till the first bitterness of the disillusionment was past as for isabel she put on a brave face before the world and spent her days in laughter and her nights in tears while paul hid his misery under a mask of stern moroseness she concealed hers under an affectation of frivolity she had never seemed so gay or so heartless or so worldly and after a while her imagination almost persuaded her that she cared as little as she pretended to care she never allowed herself time to think and she nearly succeeded in believing that she was really forgetting paul nevertheless she grew thinner and paler and there was a wan look underneath her restless brilliancy that lady farley did not care to see isabel never had any news of paul he had completely passed out of her life but paul managed to glean tidings of isabel and the news that she was more amusing and more admired than ever did not in any way lessen his misery paul wrote a curt letter to his own people saying that isabel had broken off the engagement but giving no reason and he begged that her name might never again be mentioned in his hearing the minister was sorry but felt that it was according to the decree of providence mrs seaton was grieved but feared that it was owing to the pride of paul and joanna was angry and felt sure that it was because of the vanity of isabel all of which suppositions were not without a foundation of truth lady farley tried hard not to be glad that the engagement was broken off but she only succeeded in hiding her gladness from her niece and she comforted isabel according to her lights by taking her into society more untiringly than ever one night towards the end of the season there was a party at the marchioness of wallingford's and isabel was as usual surrounded by a small court of men she was looking particularly well in a yellow gown which suited her dark hair to perfection mr matterley on learning from her in the row that morning that yellow was to be her only wear at this party had sent her a spray of yellow roses but isabel hated yellow roses she had worn one in her belt the day that paul made her go for a walk with him and therefore like ben jonson's rosy wreath such flowers thenceforward smelt not of themselves but paul so she threw away the artist's gift and would not touch it again 
i suppose you will shortly be going down to elton manor miss carnaby and thereby turning london into a desert said lord wrexham no replied isabel i am not going to elton but to hamburg instead i am getting too old for the country do you know i cannot allow that remonstrated his lordship yes i am i consider the country is only suited to people who are young enough to go in for picnics and ideals and things of that kind up to five-and-twenty sunsets excite your highest emotions and make you yearn after the impossible after five-and-twenty they give you rheumatism and show up your wrinkles i like the country remarked lord robert thistletown though i am at last in the proud position of being able to deny the soft impeachment of being under five-and-twenty it always makes me feel good and fills me with the desire to sing hymns and to write to my mother i also like the country murmured mr matterley it gives me a peaceful lotus-eating kind of feeling which is most soothing isabel shook her head i could stand a land where it was always afternoon but what i cannot endure is a land where it is always sunday evening i thought you liked sunday evenings and things of that kind remarked lord robert i used to but i have outgrown them replied isabel dear lady i understand sighed mr matterley i never cared for sunday evenings myself but i used to adore holman hunt it is the same kind of sentiment and indicates the state of mind which would revel in wordsworth's ode on the intimations of immortality have you outgrown it too i have not outgrown my appreciation of the art and the poetry thus embodied but i have ceased to have any feeling excited thereby save admiration i suppose the real explanation is that as we grow older we lose in imagination what we gain in experience said lord wrexham isabel shrugged her shoulders i think it rather lies in the fact that in drinking the draught of life we soon get through the white froth on the top and come to the small beer underneath well i like sunday evenings and hymns and things in that line persisted lord bobby i even go to the length of liking christmas day a man who can like christmas day will drink sweet champagne and enjoy it remarked matterley lord bobby shook his head oh i won't go that far now i on the contrary said isabel cannot bear christmas day it is neither one thing nor another yes it is argued lord bobby it is both it is a delicious compound of sunday morning and saturday afternoon just so replied isabel it wears a silk blouse with a serge skirt and so is neither sunday nor weekday now sweet champagne i do like and if people give their guests dry champagne i think sugar and cream ought to be handed round with it as they are with tea but christmas day is another thing to the young it brings unqualified bliss i admit but to the mature it brings passive depression followed by active indigestion but you used to be awfully keen on goodness and all that sort of thing objected lord robert i never met such a girl for ideals as you were at one time my dear bobby i was once awfully keen on dolls and blind man's bluff as i told you i'm growing old lord robert looked puzzled and disappointed but you still believe in good people don't you miss carnaby oh yes but they bore me i believe in quinine as a drug but i think it is very nasty as a flavour lord wrexham smiled indulgently the fact is that you have such a gay and sunny nature yourself that too much seriousness oppresses you and overpowers you ethereal beings cannot exist in a heavy atmosphere i cannot endure the sort of good people who have their biographies written exclaimed isabel 
nevertheless biography is the style of fiction i most affect said mr matterley especially the biographies of people i have met it is so interesting to learn that what one had despised as dullness was in reality genius and that what one had regretted as rudeness was in reality the scorn of a great soul for conventions while what one condemned as bad temper was actually a noble struggle against evil added isabel a saint in crape is twice a saint in print murmured the artist you shall write our biographies mr matterley and show how i was wise lord bobby was profound and lord wrexham was i don't know what lord wrexham had better be amusing perhaps suggested his lordship quietly i should like to see you with a really serious-minded man and hear how you got on with him said mr matterley i mean one of the sort of men who go in for duties and responsibilities and queer fads of that sort and always keep a tame conscience in full work on the premises isn't it funny remarked isabel thoughtfully that if a woman talks to a man about his soul other women call her a saint while well, if she talks to him about his heart they call her a flirt they have not the sense to know that the flirtiness consists in talking to the man about himself at all all the men laughed there is really nothing to talk about but ourselves continued isabel just as there is really nothing for breakfast but bacon people try all sorts of fancy subjects and dishes but they come back to where they started from like boomerangs you are a very clever young lady said lord wrexham appreciatively you combine such keen powers of perception with such a great facility of expression thank you i have devoted a considerable time to the proper study of mankind and i consider myself a proficient in the subject it is a subject which repays careful study my dear lady remarked matterley i know only one that excels it in interest and that one being composed entirely of brilliant exceptions ungoverned by any guiding rules i should describe as a dangerous recreation rather than as a proper study i don't believe you understand men as well as you think you do exclaimed lord bobby bluntly isabel raised her pretty eyebrows don't i though pardon me thistletown said mr matterley you are surely mistaken miss carnaby's knowledge of this subject is experimental as well as profound and her treatment of it is beyond sometimes considerably beyond all praise an angry spot burned on isabel's cheek you are pleased to be very witty this evening mr matterley once upon a time added the artist there was a rose who imagined she knew how to make beeswax because there were always some bees buzzing round her it amused the bees and what was the end of the story asked isabel the end dear lady there is but one end to all stories the rose faded end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter fifteen angus gray he proved that hope was all a lie and faith a form of bigotry and love a snare that caught him then thought to comfort human tears by sundry ill-considered sneers 
at things his mother taught him early in the year following isabel's cruel treatment of paul a novel was published which made some little stir it was called shams and shadows and was by an unknown author angus gray it was not what is generally known as a bad book yet nevertheless it was very far from being good its cleverness was undeniable but on the other hand its style was flippant its teaching mischievous and its philosophy cynical in the extreme the aim of the book was to prove that the fashionable world is rotten at the core and that the religious world is no better and that in all churches and sects there are little side chapels dedicated to mammon where the majority of the worshippers are to be found angus gray was apparently a man who had eaten of apples of sodom and had found them turned to ashes in his mouth and he was anxious to share his meal with the rest of mankind and to exclude no one from partaking of his bitter hospitality evidently he was a disappointed man and his disappointment had not improved him with a crude and cheap cynicism he set forth that the ideals of youth are a dream and the professions of later life a delusion and he sneered alike at the follies of the young and the pretences of the middle-aged to angus gray there was nothing sacred nothing holy and he pointed his morals and adorned his tale with caricatures of personages well known in society to the initiated some of the characters in shams and shadows were portraits but thinly disguised it was easy to recognize lord wrexham bobby thistletown and mr matterley but the best-drawn character in the book was the heroine who was the counterfeit presentment of isabel carnaby yet not isabel as she really was and as nature had meant her to be but isabel as she appeared to outward seeming when the worldly and frivolous side of her character was uppermost she had all isabel's fun and sparkle and good humour but underneath them lay a cold and shallow selfishness which disgusted the readers she had at first charmed at first everybody was asking who angus gray could be as it was evident that he was some one well versed in the ways of this particular set but gradually it was whispered about that the author of shams and shadows was that young seaton whom isabel carnaby threw over last season lady farley was not surprised to hear this she had long suspected it but she took it upon herself to break the news to isabel as she did not know how her niece would take it by the way she said to isabel one day it has come out at last who angus gray really is it is the nom de plume of paul seaton isabel started up her face very white who told you so it isn't true i won't believe it but you must believe it my dear it is an open secret everybody knows how can people be so unjust paul would never have written a horrid book like that i know him too well to believe such a thing i grant you that it is not a nice book said lady farley nor one that a gentleman would have written but that he did write it there is no doubt for bobby thistletown met him and asked him straight out if he had adopted the name of angus gray and mr seaton confessed that he had you know how bobby goes straight to the point and how there is no hood winking him when he wants to find out anything isabel looked dumbfounded do you mean that paul actually told bobby that he was angus gray i have told you exactly what bobby told me so you see i come straight from headquarters what else did bobby say to paul asked isabel 
oh he congratulated him on the success of his book and mr seaton thanked him and said it had already had a great sale but the fact is that bobby was so disgusted with the personal tone of the book that he did not care to be on friendly terms with the author so he cut the conversation somewhat short do you think it is such a horrid book aunt caroline it isn't an improving book no one pretends that it is but it is very smart and i cannot see that you of all people have any right to blame paul seaton for writing it if it amuses you to break men's hearts my dear by all means do it but do not cry out if the smash makes more dust and noise than you expected breakages are often noisy from tea things upwards but paul never was flippant or cynical persisted isabel of course he was not till you made him so as you know i never liked paul seaton but i am a just woman and in this matter i cannot help saying that i consider you are more culpable than he i am not blaming you my dear child for i should probably have done the same thing at your age but if you have your fling you must be content to pay the bill isabel sighed and her aunt continued you deliberately broke the young man's heart and destroyed all his ideals yet you are surprised when in return he tries to prove to the world that love is a fable and idealism a folly it is simply the natural outcome of your action oh aunt caroline what shall i do nothing there is nothing to be done it would have been more dignified perhaps had the man not cried out when he was hurt still it is very human to cry out when our pain seems more than we can endure and i feel i cannot blame him much if any one had treated me as you have treated paul seaton i think it is in me to write quite as bitter a book as shams and shadows and probably i should have done so but paul was different lady farley smiled different from me you mean my dear you must remember that he was your lover and i am only your aunt and you look at us through differently tinted spectacles but human nature is pretty much the same in everybody and when human nature's hit too hard human nature hits back either at its fellows or at providence or at both i admit that it was somewhat ill-bred of mr seaton to abuse our hospitality by making copy of our faults still if you objected to seeing the real nature of the tartar you should not have scratched the russian so hard disappointment shows what stuff men are made of i suppose it does isabel acquiesced there is no doubt my dear isabel that you behaved very badly to paul seaton and it was a natural enough revenge i think to show to the world in the person of his heroine how heartless a fashionable woman can be i really cannot see that you have any just ground for complaint though perhaps some others of his characters have then isabel went to her own room and cried as if her heart would break she understood as no one else could the subtlety of paul's revenge and just at first she felt that her punishment was almost greater than she could bear after the secret of angus gray's identity leaked out paul seaton sent the following letter to the minister my dear father i should be grieved for you to learn from any third person that i have adopted the pseudonym of angus gray i know that shams and shadows is not a book that you will like perhaps i do not like it myself but i would remind you before you pass judgment upon it that people who are sorely disappointed do not preach gospels of peace and goodwill i also wish to tell you that however bitterly i may have been disappointed in other people the reverence i have always felt for your religion and my mother's will abide with me to my dying day 
do not let anything that you may read in the pages of shams and shadows ever lead you to doubt this your affectionate son paul seaton mrs seaton cried over shams and shadows in secret and longed to comfort the sore heart that could have written such a story joanna disapproved of the teaching of the book but could not help thinking it clever and the minister dealt justly with the matter and felt that sorrow was a reason for bitterness but not an excuse as he and joanna were going for a long country walk one monday afternoon the latter said i am sadly disappointed that the book paul has been going to write all his life has turned out to be such a book as shams and shadows he ought to have done something so different but all the same i do not blame paul as much as i blame isabel though paul has actually written the book it was isabel's cruelty to him that made him capable of writing it for i am certain that she was cruel though paul has never said so my child said mr seaton i cannot see that any unkindness on the part of isabel can justify paul's action in this matter no one does wrong without some sort of temptation or excuse yet we are none of us tempted above what we are able to bear and it is our duty to avail ourselves of the way of escape provided for us but father think how our paul must have changed before he could write a bitter cynical book like that and i cannot yet forgive the woman who has altered him so the minister shook his head a man is not justified in letting any woman however dear come between his own soul and god his happiness may depend upon the woman he loves i admit but his religion should be independent of her and of everybody except himself but supposing he cannot help it he must help it joanna it is a man's first duty to be religious a man who is not religious is not a whole man he may have a fine literary style and be an accomplished scholar but he is not made in the image of god but would you call paul's book irreligious asked joanna her father thought for a moment i am afraid i should it is not of course atheistic or immoral i do not mean that but it is cynical and flippant and he that is not with me is against me joanna sighed it is sometimes difficult to be religious it ought not to be religion is not a bill of pains and penalties but a charter of happiness but understand me i do not condemn paul's book because it does not preach any special tenet or uphold any peculiar creed for the older i grow the more catholic do i become i am not like that said joanna as i grow older the more fondly do i cling to my own ism not because it is an ism but because it is my own you are still a great deal younger than i am our division lines are far too strong the church began in catholicity and must end in catholicity and i would avoid all peculiar garbs or shibboleths anything which connects godliness with a grey gown or a close bonnet is not religion at all but sectarianism therefore i do not blame my son for not preaching methodism i only blame him for not preaching christ yet you love methodism as much as i do don't you father the minister's face glowed yes i love it of course i love it but i do not condemn those who do not love it as i do as long as there are different types of character there must be different forms of worship yet nothing appeals to me like the good old methodist fashion of bringing religion into the common experiences of everyday life and treating it as a familiar thing to a ritualist this might seem irreverent to a broad churchman oppressive but i always feel it may be said of the methodists as of the israelites of old they did eat and drink and saw god the thing that grieves me in paul's book 
is its want of idealism and its disbelief in the underlying goodness of human nature remarked joanna as they turned into chaford wood i do not agree with you there human nature apart from god is not a fine thing and i have no sympathy whatever in the modern worship of humanity with a capital h human nature is our disease christ is our cure and a physician who diagnoses any complaint without suggesting the remedy may be an able scientist but he is a sorry doctor i cannot quarrel with paul for showing us that human nature is bad but i do quarrel with him for trying to show us that religion is not much better still we must do paul justice said joanna loyally and one cannot deny that shams and shadows is a brilliantly clever book so be it yet it is character not intellect that governs this world and inherits the next yet father if paul were really in such dreadful trouble and bitterness of spirit he could not write a book and keep himself and therefore his sorrow out of it perhaps not replied mr seaton then why write a book at all our fathers doubtless sorrowed as we sorrow now yet they locked their grief up in their own breasts while we proclaim it on the housetops i cannot approve the modern custom of telling out all we know and feel don't you think people ought to write books asked joanna not unless they have a message to deliver and moreover a message which will make for good and not for evil now every boy who learns a lesson or loves a woman must needs write a book about it till we feel inclined to ask like the egyptian of old who made thee a ruler and a judge over us that is quite true people are too anxious to make a stir in the world continued her father the doctrine of to-day is that it is disgraceful to be unknown the souls of modern men need all their wings to enable them to fly as quickly as their fellows and they have none left wherewith to cover their faces and their feet but father it is natural for men to long for fame natural doubtless my child but not spiritual why will not men be content to love christ and live contentedly as failures remembering that humanly speaking his religion is a failure in the world to-day still people have to make a living argued joanna the practical and if they can do it better by writing books than in any other way i do not see why they shouldn't if making a living be all we think of we had better have been cows or horses said mr seaton in the present day money and amusement are the only things people really care about and poor things they are wherewith to satisfy immortal souls but a writer is in a measure a preacher and takes responsibilities upon himself towards others which he is bound to fulfil yes father dear i see what you mean every writer is an evangelist of some sort homer preached the gospel of war and virgil taught the ancients the blessedness of a peasant's lot horace pointed out the inherent meanness of human nature and in milton's hands we may say of the epic as of the sonnet that the thing became a trumpet to proclaim the religious tenets of the puritans and i would rather that my son had followed in the steps of virgil or of milton than of homer or horace and then mr seaton went on to expound to his daughter the messages and the methods of the ancient schools of poetry and let paul and his doings alone not long after this paul seaton came home for a short visit but his holiday did not prove a success his family carefully refrained from saying anything derogatory of shams and shadows but paul was so much afraid of their doing so that he was on the defensive all the time and consequently decidedly disagreeable moreover he was still very unhappy and unhappiness does not tend to social charm he appreciated his parents forbearance about shams and shadows more than they had any idea of but as yet he was too sore and too deeply wounded to be able to say pleasant things to anybody 
therefore he unjustly got the credit of not feeling them altogether life was passing but roughly for paul at that particular time just before he went back to town edgar said to him you won't be vexed with me will you old fellow if i speak to you as a friend about matters which do not concern me well what is it asked paul ungraciously i want you to write another book to counteract the influence of shams and shadows no one understands better than i do the feelings which influenced you when you wrote it but feelings pass away and a man is not always the same man the talent displayed in the pages of your book might have a decided influence for good if used in a right direction and i want you so to use it and to rise to higher things on the stepping-stone of the dead self that wrote shams and shadows paul smoked in silence and edgar went on and there is another argument i would use if i were sure you would forgive me for using it and not think me interfering or impertinent go on said paul it is all right you see said edgar if we do anything as the result of a state of mind which has been brought on by the action of another person that person is in a measure responsible for our action paul nodded and edgar continued if we had ever loved that person i do not think we should like to feel that they through us had wrought lasting evil this conviction would be a source of endless remorse to us for the old love's sake even long after that love was a thing of the past we might be content to bear the consequences of our own share of ill-doing but we could not endure the idea that we ourselves had increased the responsibility of any one who had once been dear to us however thoroughly they might have forfeited our affection i won't say any more old man it is very good of you to have listened to me so far and i think you will understand what i mean look here replied paul you have spoken very kindly to me and i appreciate what you have said and perhaps still more what you have left unsaid and i will confess to you what i have confessed to no other living soul namely that i regret with all my heart that shams and shadows was ever written i would gladly give twenty years of my life to unwrite it if i could but that unfortunately is impossible you cannot unwrite it i know said edgar but you can write a new book that will prove its antidote and by your new book's superior depth and power you can make men forget that shams and shadows was ever written and he laid a brotherly hand on his friend's shoulder paul rose from his chair and stood with one elbow on the chimney-piece that is what i have been intending to do for some time i mean to devote all my powers to writing a book in my right mind and in my right name and i will endeavour to teach men that what is good is good and what is bad is bad which is after all the end of human wisdom and people shall see that the cynicism of shams and shadows was the crying of an unhappy and wayward child rather than the knowledge and experience of a full-grown man what will be the name of the new book asked edgar paul thought for a moment i think i shall call it some better thing he said End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thorny croft fowler chapter sixteen success upon the mountain top i stood and all the land beneath me lay i saw that earth was very good but heaven seemed just as far away 
it was in the following winter that paul seaton's great book some better thing took the literary world by storm and carried its author at one bound from mere notoriety to abiding fame everybody read the book and everybody who read it was the better for reading it it was a novel with a purpose and its purpose was to show that it is only by righteousness that men and nations prevail also that there is much that is humorous in life as well as much that is holy and that healing virtue lies in laughter as well as in prayers and tears it was a strong book and yet infinitely pathetic and it was perfectly free from the taint of shallow cynicism on the one hand and of mawkish sentimentality on the other preachers recommended its teaching and speakers quoted its epigrams and in short paul seaton became the man of the hour and angus gray was forgotten this latter end was the more easily accomplished because the first edition of shams and shadows was sold out and another was not forthcoming some better thing brought great joy to the heart of mark seaton that his son was among the successful writers of the day was nothing to him but that his son was among the great teachers of the day was everything mrs seaton and joanna likewise rejoiced and felt that shams and shadows was expiated and done away with so happiness reigned once more in chaford cottage as for paul himself the success of his book pleased him to a certain extent and it was a source of keen delight to him to feel that men no longer condemned him as the writer of shams and shadows but rather respected him as the author of some better thing but isabel had spoiled his life for him he felt and no mere public applause could fill up the aching blank that she had left she had gone near to marring his character as well but he had come safely through the dark valley of humiliation and disappointment and stood whole and in his right mind on the farther side yet his happiness had not survived the chills of the dark valley and fame without happiness is but a sorry jest at best what matters it to a thirsty man if his empty cup be of gold or silver or of finest glass such outside splendours will not slake his thirst nevertheless in paul's mind the thought was ever present that isabel carnaby would see some better thing and would read as much perhaps between the lines as the public could read in them and if the truth must be told this thought gave him more pleasure than all his literary triumph for in spite of what had happened his love for isabel was as strong as ever and his hope was not yet dead that some day they two might be brought together again and might bid bygones be bygones paul knew that the ideal isabel whom he had loved was no creature of his own imagination but the real isabel as god had intended her to be he had merely recognized not imagined the soul of the woman hidden under her somewhat frivolous exterior he believed that this soul was not extinct but merely dormant for a time and he knew that he was the only man who had power to awaken it fully to life again there was no doubt that isabel had been cruel as well as wilful but perhaps he had been too hard and stern for so highly strong a nature as hers and to those that love much surely much can be forgiven anyhow isabel had not committed the one crowning offence in his eyes she had not put another man in his place and as long as she was still miss carnaby paul felt there was yet a possible morning of joy to his present night of weeping early in the year paul went down to chaford and was welcomed as a conquering hero the family at the cottage were never tired of talking about some better thing but shams and shadows was only once alluded to and then by paul himself father do you think that shams and shadows is now atoned for he asked one day my son we will never speak of shams and shadows more 
do you think that when the angel led peter out of prison they talked of the denial or when moses stood on the mount of transfiguration he was reminded of his disobedience at meribah the teaching of modern philosophy is that what is done is done and what we have written we have written and that there is no atonement for the deed once accomplished and no washing out of the handwriting against us but i have not so learned christ then do you believe that what is done can ever be undone asked paul surely that is impossible i do not wish to prophesy smooth things replied his father nor to sprinkle the way of life with rose-water i know that if a man breaks the laws of nature he will be punished to the uttermost for there is no forgiveness in nature i know that if a man breaks the laws of society he will find neither remission nor mercy for there is no forgiveness in society but i believe that if a man breaks the law of god his transgression can be taken away as though it had never been for there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared it is a grand gospel that you preach father and seems almost too good to be true nothing is too good to be true the truth is the best of everything i believe that said paul but i did not always before you were afflicted you went astray answered the minister but the word is very nigh you now i hope so the modern gospel of the grandeur of human nature is a hard one said mr seaton and tends rather to exalt the creature than to glorify the creator if the great object of life is the formation of our own character then i grant you each action must leave its indelible mark but if the great object of life is the glory of god then surely the mistakes of foolish men will not be allowed to cast lasting shadows across the eternal light you think our ideas are too small yes and too personal the business of our lives is to give glory to god and it is of no moment whether we do it by sounding his praises abroad or by keeping his commandments at home it seems to me that nowadays men think and talk too much about improving their own characters and meditate too little upon the perfection of the divine character they ought to do the one without leaving the other undone said paul i cannot admit that holiness is a substitute for usefulness you and i travel by different roads and our methods are not alike yet both our ways lead up to jerusalem as all roads lead to rome yes replied paul the railways are not laid along the old coach roads but they bring us to the same places as the coaches did and more quickly too added mr seaton i must not forget that during his stay at chaford paul saw a great deal of mr ford these two shared many opinions both political and otherwise and much enjoyed mutual intercourse i wish you could knock some of your common sense into edgar said edgar's father one day it would be invaluable to him in his political career the inculcation of common sense is a complicated operation replied paul i know it sighed michael ford does edgar intend to go into parliament soon paul asked as he and mr ford walked down the high street together i mean him to stand for chaford at the next election the sitting member hawken has decided to retire after the present parliament and the liberal executive of chaford have resolved to accept edgar in his place as their candidate i suppose it will be a walk-over for edgar practically so chaford has always returned a liberal and a liberal of the good old school none of your new-fangled faddists besides edgar would be sure of the wesleyan vote solid no wesleyan however conservative would vote against one of the fords of chaford that is quite true the wesleyans are a wonderful people for pulling together what i am afraid of continued mr ford is that edgar will go in for somewhat extreme measures instead of jogging along on the good old beaten track i suppose he would be sure of the seat even if his views were decidedly advanced but i'd rather he had adopted the political creed which satisfied his fathers before him 
still our father's creeds and our father's faiths do not always fit us mr ford and i do not believe in equipping ourselves for the battle of life with second-hand weapons and armour even though they be inherited from our parents what should you think of a soldier who went to war to-day in the coat of mail worn by his ancestors during the crusades or was content to arm himself for the fray with a musket that did good service at waterloo i should call him a picturesque fool so should i i think that it is every man's duty to keep abreast of the time continued paul whether he be a doctor or a politician you would not consider a doctor was breaking the fifth commandment because he refused to cure fever by cupping or smallpox by inoculation then why should you bring this charge against the politician who has outgrown the liberalism of the whigs mr ford shook his head you young men always think you know better than the old ones we don't really know better we only know what is better for us and for our generation politicians are the faculty of the state and it is their business as it is the doctor's business to prescribe for the diseases of to-day and not for the diseases of the past century the medicines which cured the latter will probably have no effect upon the former you mean that each generation has its own difficulties to contend with and must therefore use its own special methods there is a good deal in what you say i must admit where i disapprove of modern philosophy continued paul is when it begins to sneer at the teaching of former schools my argument cuts both ways if we know our own business better than our fathers they knew their business better than we do each generation understands what is best for itself and it is just as foolish for us to deride our father's methods as for them to despise ours their ways were the ways for yesterday as ours are the ways for to-day and the transference of either would be an anachronism mr ford nodded i see and i am almost tempted to agree with you but besides the unwisdom of laughing at our father's methods it seems to me such atrociously bad form if a young man adopts verbatim either the religious or the political creed of his father i probably shall not agree with him but i shall respect him as an honourable man who is just as likely to be right as i am but if a man sneers at and is ashamed of the things which his father cherished and believed in i regard that man as a cad and should decline to ask him to dinner there you are quite right i cannot bear to hear young folks jeering at the old faiths but the worst is when they do it for social reasons and not from any honest conviction paul went on it makes me perfectly ill to see men treat their parents as family secrets because the good old folks do not happen to vote on the side of the aristocracy or worship according to established form they have an idea that in burying the ancestral radicalism and nonconformity out of sight they thereby identify themselves with the high-born and orthodox i know they do just as some men think that to walk up to their business in a pair of riding breeches places them socially on a level with a master of hounds mr ford enjoyed this joke he rode to hounds himself and was a good horseman and they forget that cutting oneself off from one's own class does not attach one to a higher class it merely leaves one without a class at all he concluded exactly agreed paul between heaven and earth like mahomet's coffin i don't of course deny that it is a good thing to be well-born and wealthy i only say that it is a bad thing to pretend to be so when you are not i don't deny that it is a good thing to be handsome but a man had better have a snub nose of his own than an artificial aquiline that is perfectly true i cannot blame people for seeing the humorous side of much that their parents considered wholly serious added paul nor for laughing tenderly and among themselves at old-fashioned forms which they have outgrown but laughing tenderly and sneering are two very different things for instance a man who nowadays could read such books as the fairchild family and stories from the church catechism without a smile would be lacking in a sense of humour but a man who sneered at the underlying godliness thus quaintly embodied would be deficient in true reverence and spiritual insight
quite so besides i cannot understand the indifference to the charm of old association which would permit a man to regard with anything but tenderness the faith in which he was brought up however far he might leave it behind in his mature years for instance nothing would induce me to wear boots with elastic sides i think they are extremely uncomfortable and unhealthy and unbecoming nevertheless i never kept sight of those worn by my mother without being conscious of a wave of tender amusement and for her sake all women who walk through life in elastic-sided boots are in a measure sacred to me mr ford smiled as he looked at the well-dressed man walking by his side yet you yourself would not buy a pair of boots unless they had patent fasteners and cork soles and every other invention of modern times of course i should not which things are an allegory eh dear sighed mr ford i wish i had a son like you what a political future i would have mapped out for him i am afraid i am a person who does not lend himself to mapping out i should like to go into political life i confess but i fear my politics would not always be your politics mr ford i think they would in great issues and we would leave the trifles to take care of themselves we are both opportunists paul the only difference between us is the difference between the opportunities of thirty years ago and the opportunities of, of to-day i think you have hit the nail on the head why don't you go in for political life yourself asked michael ford abruptly quickening his pace because i can't afford it i am a poor man and all my people are poor i make a fair income by editing the pendulum and writing anonymous articles for a good many of the dailies but not an income that would allow of anything like a parliamentary career but shams and shadows and some better thing must have brought you in a good deal i have not yet received my royalties on some better thing and i could not touch a penny of the profits of shams and shadows now there my dear boy you are wrong and you must forgive an old friend for telling you so that shams and shadows was a false step i admit and i am very glad that you have so soon retrieved it by contradicting all its nonsense in some better thing but i consider it a piece of idiotic quixotism to refuse the money that shams and shadows made i think you must please let me be the judge of that said paul quietly but my good fellow you are making a mistake and are acting more like edgar than like yourself throwing away the money which you fairly earned by your very clever if somewhat foolish book is a piece of gratuitous self-denial which will do no good to anybody paul smiled the smile of the obstinate and mr ford continued well it is extremely silly of you now you were right not to publish a second edition of your book although such an edition might have been of pecuniary advantage to you because you saw that the book was unsound and you had ceased to believe in your former teaching for this i admire and respect you but i cannot see why you should hesitate to appropriate the proceeds of the copies already sold paul walked on in silence for a few seconds then he said i simply could not do it and that is the end of it i could have believed edgar capable of such a piece of folly but not you grumbled mr ford i am sorry to make myself disagreeable but i fear i am one of the self-opinionated people who think they know their own business best and i suppose you won't tell me what you mean to do with the sacrificial proceeds of your first book you cannot leave them with the publishers i don't know what your royalty on shams and shadows was but however small you must do something with it mr ford spoke with irritation and he was a man of business you think i am bound to accept the minor profits you mean my father has a great sermon on that subject but he spells it with a difference a poor joke is no substitute for a plain answer paul do you remember the lady who was afraid she had asked an indiscreet question of talleyrand and was told that a question is never indiscreet but an answer may be you have not yet outgrown your quixotism i see my dear boy not i and i happen to be suffering from a pretty sharp attack of it just now brought on i suppose by fine weather and flattery judiciously blended so you must bear with my youthful follies i could bear with a great deal from such a clever man as that said mr ford to himself after he had parted from paul he'll make a name in the world which men will remember and that carnaby girl was a fool to throw up her chance of bearing it 
so gradually peace and something akin to happiness slid into the soul of paul seaton in spite of all that had happened he believed that isabel in her heart of hearts really cared for him and that he was the only man who could completely satisfy her and he knew beyond a doubt that she was the only woman who could ever satisfy him surely it would all come right in the end he thought it was against every principle of political economy that so much mutual devotion should be wasted to all other women he was utterly indifferent and this indifference was so patent to the eyes of alice martin that she soon ceased to wear her best hat when there was a chance of meeting him best hats like horses require regular air and exercise but when they are no longer needed for the driving of one particular man to distraction they are not infrequently used to convey another in the same direction thus it came to pass that alice began to put on her best hat when there was a possibility of seeing or rather of being seen by edgar ford of course edgar did not know what had happened he only thought that alice seemed to grow prettier every day but this is a not uncommon delusion of edgar's sex they think that a particular girl is growing decidedly better looking but it does not always strike them that the increase of beauty is due to the fact that this particular girl has begun to put on her best clothes whenever there is an off chance of meeting with them here is something that ought to delight you said mr seaton handing the newspaper to paul one day the minister of education has been delivering an inaugural address for some literary society and he has quoted your new book as the wisest book that has been published during the last ten years he considers that the political part of it ought to be used as a textbook for budding politicians and he foretells a brilliant political as well as literary career for the author well played o willoughby exclaimed paul i once met him at the estales and found him a very decent fellow then but this proves him to be possessed of almost supernatural powers of insight and foresight give me the paper and let me read my praise and glory for myself it will make you vain said joanna you'd be vain if cabinet ministers grovel before you retorted her brother i know i should nobody ever grovel before me but it would make me vain if an infant did let alone a pillar of the state paul's face fairly beamed i'm awfully glad that willoughby approved of my views on education your next book had better touch on all matters connected with the state suggested joanna you might have a chapter on sanitation for the president of the local government board to lecture upon and a chapter on commerce for the president of the board of trade to lecture upon so that like freedom you might slowly broaden down from president to president how rude you are exclaimed paul you don't deserve to have a great author for a brother you really don't i take a broad view of the fifth commandment and i think that it includes respect to brothers as well as to parents joanna shook her head you are always too broad in your views that is your great fault the bible thoroughly understands human nature and never commands the impossible therefore it tells us to love our brother but it never suggests or hints at such a thing as respect for him then she and her father started for a walk and paul sat down to enjoy mr willoughby's lecture and to dream over the glorious possibilities that it opened up it was a great compliment and paul was the last man to pretend that he was not delighted when he was after he had read the purport of the lecture his eye wandered idly over the rest of the paper till it was suddenly arrested by the following paragraph a marriage is arranged and will shortly take place between lord wrexham and isabel only daughter of the late major carnaby and niece of sir benjamin farley g c b End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter seventeen vernacre park trim the shrubs and mow the grass roll the alleys shady make the ways where she will pass fitter for my lady 
there was a large house-party at vernacre park at easter to meet miss carnaby who had just become engaged to the host lord wrexham old lady wrexham played the part of hostess a most stately and chilly dame whom isabel could not endure and in addition to the party from elton the company included the esdales lord robert thistletown and mr matterley besides sundry uneventful persons whom nobody took the trouble to differentiate isabel had been in a most reckless mood ever since she accepted lord wrexham she had definitely decided to stifle the romantic and to develop the worldly side of her character and having made up her mind to permanently adopt the role of a shallow smart woman she almost overdid her part in her anxiety to do herself injustice it certainly was a triumphal procession for her this visit to vernacre as its future mistress for vernacre was one of the finest residences in the midlands as they were sitting at lunch on good friday lady esdale remarked isn't it funny how hungry going to church always makes one i never have recourse to those artificial aids to appetite murmured matterly i am always ravenous on sundays continued lady esdale and my appetite has evidently mistaken to-day for a sunday a pardonable error replied the artist for my intellectual powers have fallen into it too i am glad that you are hungry lady esdale said the hostess but not surprised for vernacre is always considered a peculiarly invigorating place the situation is salubrious and the subsoil old red sandstone i never feel so well anywhere as i do at vernacre i am always hungry in the country and thirsty in london continued lady esdale and that is why i am so much sorrier for poor people in the country than in town it must be so horrid to feel hungry and have nothing to eat don't you know it must indeed agreed lord wrexham and i have often wondered that the health of the lower classes is not even more seriously impaired than it is considering that they must frequently be compelled to leave their hunger only partially satisfied if at all i remember that aunt caroline and i were once kept stuck on a journey for hours far away from any station and we had nothing to eat or drink save a small bottle of cough syrup she happened to have in her dressing-bag we had to take occasional nips at that and because it was scarce we thought it delicious i never was addicted to cough syrup before but since then i have preferred it to champagne perhaps it was made palatable on purpose suggested lord wrexham some of those patent medicines are often far from repulsive to the taste oh no it was nasty enough really replied isabel but poverty made it sweet and i believe poor people get lots of treats like that lord wrexham shook his head i fear you are right and that the poor are too fond of taking quack doses not recommended by the faculty it is a bad habit but i presume that economy is their motive i didn't mean that i only meant that when you are poor life must be like one everlasting picnic i once wanted to be poor myself i thought it would be such fun i once was poor said matterly and i am bound to admit that the joke fell short of your expectations miss carnaby isabel helped herself to plover's eggs i felt i was foolish at the time and i prayed for more wisdom it is always safe to pray for the inevitable said the artist it strengthens faith without incommoding providence having got wisdom i now pray for the rest of life's good things like solomon riches and honours and fine clothes and horses and carriages en suite i never pray for what i see in the shop windows said matterly i choose what i think will suit me and know that it will be put down in my bill isabel's lip curled you are very bourgeois 
in your ideas i don't think so i am merely honest with myself and do not call transactions providential which are merely commercial the temple and the money changers should be kept far apart i think madly that you misunderstand miss carnaby said lord wrexham in his slow kind way as he smiled indulgently upon isabel she does not really mean that she would ask providence for things with which her tradesmen could supply her of course i shouldn't pray for what i could pay for added isabel the artist bowed if i have misunderstood miss carnaby i humbly beg her pardon by the way he continued i once heard a story of a very devout cornish wrecker who never retired to rest without praying for a storm that always appeals to my sense of humour were his prayers answered asked isabel there were always plenty of wrecks if that is what you mean the wreckers were a terrible people said lord wrexham and it was a terrible state of society which made such things possible it is a comfort to think that these customs were confined to cornwall and the last century said isabel were they asked madeley i think so replied lord wrexham of course one has heard of wrecks and salvage on other shores but i believe that the custom of deliberately causing wrecks by means of false lights was peculiar to cornwall i hope you are right said the artist i cannot of course give names or dates but i have an idea that i have heard of cases of cruel and avoidable wrecks in other counties than cornwall and considerably later than the last century indeed i had believed that such savagery was extinct in england i suppose however that the love of gain was the motive now as then and his lordship looked quite distressed and the love of excitement dear me how shocking such things are shocking agreed madderley and doubly shocking to those who have witnessed their effects isabel laughed a hard little laugh perhaps mr madderley will make use of his artistic power to describe some of these harrowing spectacles i shall do nothing of the kind dear lady such descriptions would not be fit for pretty ears i believe even the wreckers themselves would rather not see the consequences of their cruelty therefore such things should be kept from the knowledge of refined and tender-hearted women whose nature it is to be kind and pitiful you are quite right madderley said lord wrexham approvingly descriptions of horrors and cruelties are most unfit for women's ears in my opinion but isabel still looked defiant perhaps then mr madderley will tell us where these modern and fiendish wreckers are to be found the artist strolled to the sideboard to cut himself some ham on the sea-coast of bohemia and thereabouts don't take any notice of him wrexham said isabel petulantly he is only making up just to irritate me lord wrexham was surprised why isabel what is the matter with you you and madderley used to be such friends i know we used but friendships don't wear for ever any more than clothes i have always noticed remarked madderley that the untried friendships are those which last the longest what is that you are saying about friendships cried lord bobby from the other end of the table the place of honour to which his rank entitled him was a grievous burden to this irrepressible youth i can give you no end of information on the subject as platonic friendship is the line in which i excel i do not believe in platonic friendships said lady farley the woman is all right but the man always cares too much or too little for the arrangement to be a success you are wrong cried lord bobby i have scores in good working order just now so i speak with authority on the subject they are all most successful and i start a new one every other week which i suppose you call a neo-platonic friendship suggested the artist 
don't be so horribly clever replied lord bobby it gives me the headache and will undermine your constitution in time my experience of platonic friendships is that they generally end in the woman's losing her head remarked Matterly. mine is that they invariably end in the man's losing his temper added isabel i notice that as a rule the man is either bored to death by the whole thing said lady farley or else overdraws his account on the bank of friendship and is surprised when in consequence the bank will not cash his cheques that latter case is more often true of the woman than of the man i think replied matterly lady farley shook her head no men are much more exacting than women in their friendships that is to say if they really care it seems to me that men either care a great deal about things or not at all while women have a regular thermometer of degrees of affection and interest i think you are right there agreed lord wrexham men are so much simpler and less complex than women oh we are grander altogether agreed lord bobby simpler and yet more sublime don't you know one cannot help admiring us though on our corns the little spitfires tread tobacco smoke and ruffle crowns our head everybody laughed and lady farley continued i have studied men carefully for many years and i feel that i am now qualified to carry on a satisfactory platonic friendship but of course being married i have not time or inclination for the thing soldiers don't run out of a battle to try their skill at a shooting range they have heavier work on hand sir benjamin chuckled with delight still my dear you can give these young and single persons some of the benefit of your superior wisdom can't you tell us how you would carry on a platonic friendship aunt caroline said violet estale well in the first place i should never argue with a man men hate it so and it does no earthly good in my young days i naturally used to endeavour to prove i was right when i knew i was but now when a man puts me straight as to facts of which he is absolutely ignorant i merely accept his correction and say i must have been misinformed of course i know all the time that i am right and he is wrong but what does that matter it is a woman's duty to be socially attractive not statistically correct and what else should you do lady farley asked her host i should never attempt to amend his anecdotes this is an unpardonable sin i have known homes broken up and lifelong friendships destroyed by one person saying that a thing happened on thursday when the raconteur had said friday while quarrels to which there could be no reconciliation have ensued from a difference of opinion as to whether a met b by the ten twenty or the ten forty five train lady farley has studied men to some purpose said matterly the lady smiled there is such a thing as compulsory education caroline is quite right agreed lady estelle it is never any use arguing with a man in the first place he is always sure to know better than you do that was not my reason for objecting to the habit murmured lady farley but he always is that is if it is anything out of books or newspapers of course clothes are a different thing and there i should be very careful about trusting a man's taste too far at least their taste is right enough but they seem to have no proper regard for fashion perhaps now that aunt caroline has taught us how to adapt ourselves to men mr matterly will teach us how to adapt ourselves to women suggested isabel for i believe he prides himself on his profound knowledge of and contempt for the sex with pleasure whenever i am dealing with ladies i take as my guide and watchword the legend painted upon the racks of railway carriages these racks are suited for light articles only and must not be used for heavy luggage and i find this is a most successful prescription for light articles one must read pleasure luxury admiration amusement etc and for heavy luggage sickness sorrow love poverty and every other adversity i see said isabel 
i once knew a man who put his heavy luggage in the rack in spite of the printed mourning said the artist and it fell through and broke his head i knew another man who made a similar mistake in dealing with a lady the consequences were practically the same only it was his heart instead of his head that was broken isabel's eyes flashed i am afraid your friends are not as wise as you are perhaps not but i am hoping that they will learn wisdom by experience now where i find men so difficult as friends said isabel is that they never will tell you why they are vexed when a man is out of temper there is no secret about it he who runs may read and she who reads had better run away but the reason for this vexation is kept a profound secret you are quite right there agreed lady farley it is an interesting but inexplicable fact a woman is different she will probably not show at all that she is annoyed but if she shows it she will tell you the why and the wherefore that is quite true my experience of the sex is that when they are angry they do not err on the side of want of frankness sighed lord robert and then men are so jealous and exacting continued isabel that is where they disgust me the artist looked at isabel curiously as if by the outward eye he could discover whether she were as heartless as she pretended to be but her appearance afforded him no clue to the problem a man who irritates a woman by showing his jealousy and destroys her pleasure by such evil tempers is a fool and worse than a fool he said oh not worse than a fool you are pleased to be merciful miss carnaby because there is nothing worse she added i quite agree with you said matterly but some men seem to regard all things as patent or copyright which is manifestly absurd and men in love are worse in this respect than platonic friends isabel went on with her lunch while the artist continued if a clergyman or a doctor is not able owing to absence or illness to do his work he supplies a locum tenens to take his place and he is grateful to instead of offended with the latter for so doing then why cannot a lover pursue the same course and with the same sweet reasonableness i want to know the cases hardly seem to me parallel said lord wrexham looking puzzled of course it doesn't do to press a metaphor too far assented matterly another absurd thing about men isabel went on is that they expect you to like them because they are kind to you and do what you want while what you really like them for is the trick of their manner or the colour of their hair i think you are in a minority there my dear isabel said lady farley as a rule kindness appeals more to a woman than anything i believe any man could make any woman love him if he were only kind enough long enough people like us for what we do and love us for what we are interpolated sir benjamin that is my experience i know agreed isabel therefore we can make people like us but we cannot make them love us that is true of a woman said lady farley helping herself to strawberries but hardly of a man i still hold that any man can win a woman's love through kindness and i also hold that external roughness of manner will in a woman's eyes counteract the effect of any amount of secret devotion when all is said and done we like the men who will dance with us better than the men who would die for us such is the constitution of the normal female mind isabel tossed her head i do not think so but surely you like the people who are kind to you don't you asked her host no i like people because they are attractive not because they are kind i always pity children when they have to kiss grown-ups who have given them presents if i were a child i should not want to kiss the lady who had given me the prettiest present but the lady who had the prettiest face but children are taught to show forth their gratitude not only in their lives but with their lips suggested the artist it is a senseless plan all the same laughed isabel i couldn't bear to think that my friends liked me only because i was kind to them 
i do not think you need distress yourself on that score dear lady i want people to like me because i am attractive in myself not because i am amiable mr matterley shook his head i cannot commend your prudence for you will probably cease to be attractive when you are about five-and-forty while you can go on being amiable until you are eighty-nine i don't see that hundreds of women are attractive long after they are five-and-forty of course they are but they generally belong to the plump and amiable school tongue is not a dish which improves by keeping my dear lady disdain wrexham turned him out of the room at once cried isabel he is becoming insufferable what did he say i did not hear inquired the host who was feeding his dogs at that particular moment he says my tongue is too sharp and he isn't far wrong sang out lord bobby if you don't take care you'll be stung to death by your own tongue like the crocodile or the scorpion or some other old chappy you should have seen a girl i took in to dinner last week all through dinner she kept saying oh lord bobby how clever you are and she never said anything else now that is the sort of conversation that men like it is far better than the dizzying fizzying stuff that brilliant women treat us to don't you like the girls whom you think clever asked violet i like the girls who think me clever a long sight better and i don't believe that this is by any means a peculiar taste young people think and talk too much about what they like and dislike said lady wrexham rising from the table when i was a girl i knew what people were related to each other and which families were old and which new but i did not bother my head about who was attractive and who was amiable and who was neither if you have nothing special to do this afternoon thistletown said lord wrexham i wish you would drive madderly in the dog-cart to sunny hill i particularly want him to see the view from there it is such a fine one and also so typical of this part of the country i could have better shared a better plan replied bobby but my obliging nature cannot say him nay you can upset him and break all his bones for being so rude to me at lunch suggested isabel that would do him no good you may break you may shatter his bones if you will but the outward signs of an overweening vanity and a most unlovable disposition will cling to him still then the party dispersed and isabel went with her lover to see some model cottages which he had just built and which he was particularly anxious to show to her she listened patiently while he explained all the improvements and then she said i wonder if happiness is to be found in such things as subsoils and artesian wells lord wrexham looked at his cottages with satisfaction health is to be found in them and health is a constituent part of happiness perhaps of course you couldn't be happy without being healthy but it doesn't follow that you couldn't be healthy without being happy i wonder in what happiness really does lie i don't know i never thought about it but you should think about such things my dear wrexham it is stupid of you not to you know but i cannot analyse my feelings as you do i am not an introspective person i find nothing so interesting as the study of myself said isabel that is very likely but you are an interesting person and i am not so the analysis of me would prove a most wearisome experiment that has nothing to do with it the analysis of me is instructive only so far as i am normal and therefore uninteresting it shows what human nature is like when i am original i cease to be interesting from a scientific point of view i am afraid i don't quite follow you can't you see that in vivisecting a frog the more common the frog the more instructive is the experiment yes i can see that then the same principle applies to a woman but do you mean to tell me you never think about your feelings asked isabel no i feel them and that is enough for me that is very tame you see exclaimed lord wrexham i have so many other things to think about and a state like this requires a good deal of management 
and i am so anxious to do my duty by all my tenants and work people do you get really interested in the people about the place and want to know what they are all thinking and feeling and caring about of course not my dear young lady but i want them to be comfortable and prosperous and to regard me as a satisfactory landowner they walked on in silence for a short time and then isabel said isn't it funny how some people make everything into a treat by just being there i don't quite understand what you mean my dearest don't you know how the mere presence of some people will turn a stuffy little parlour into a fairy palace and a dusty street into a byway of paradise surely that is somewhat extravagant language replied lord wrexham of course i know that some sorts of society are much more congenial than others but everybody can see that do you know what it is to feel that life is made up of a lot of strange questions and problems and desires and that one person is the answer to them all persisted isabel my dearest child what funny ideas you have i am afraid that you read too much poetry and fiction and that it overexcites your brain oh i don't read all that in books replied isabel scornfully i know it of myself and by the way how many selves have you got how many selves why only one of course well that is very one-sided of you now there are five of me all neatly labelled and scheduled which are they i should like to know inquired lord wrexham oh there is my very best ideal self and my brilliant society self and my jolly everyday self and my ill and unhappy self and the demon whatever do you mean by the demon i mean me when i am shallow and selfish and worldly and say nasty sharp things and care for nothing but admiration and am a regular wretch all round what is the best self like she learned that the wisdom of this world is foolishness replied isabel dreamily and she found the key to life's holy of holies therefore i killed her because she knew too much you never met her and i have forgotten her for it is nearly two years since she died really isabel you are a little too prone to let your imagination run away with you but now i want you to look at this rusty fencing it is an idea of my own and is i think most effective oh it is pretty enough replied isabel indifferently lord wrexham's face fell i am so sorry you are not more pleased with it my darling i designed it for you and i did so hope that it would give you pleasure is there anything about it you would like different oh no it is all right you see all my delight now in improving vernacre is in making it fitter for you it could never be worthy of such a mistress as it will have but i hardly let a day pass without doing something to make it a little more meet for your acceptance it is very good of you said isabel gently as they turned away not at all it is mere selfishness on my part as my greatest pleasure lies in pleasing you i trust you will not hesitate to mention anything that you would like different either in my home or in myself and if alteration is possible it shall be made do you mean you would let me tell you of your faults of course i would replied lord wrexham and what is more i would try to correct them i once invented a game where every member of the company was told of one fault by the rest of the party unanimously on condition he or she promised to amend it and not to be offended lord wrexham opened a gate leading into the park was it a successful pastime it ought to have been but somehow it wasn't it led to strained relations all round and yet nobody seemed to have a fault the less in consequence now i played it in the proper spirit and i cured two bad faults of my own it was very impertinent of anybody to dare to tell you of your faults isabel and if i had been there i would have told them so no it wasn't at all impertinent it was only part of the game 
i forget what my faults were continued isabel musingly but i know i cured them both i wish you would play that game with me and tell me where you would like me to be different said lord wrexham rather wistfully i know i am stupid and not quick at understanding things but that seems more a misfortune than a fault at any rate i don't get over it and no one but myself knows how hard i try but anything that i could alter i, I gladly would to make life with me less dull for you my dear you haven't any faults wrexham not a single one lord wrexham smiled with pleasure but your virtues are rather overcrowded like the shrubs at elton continued isabel and would be all the better for a little thinning out lord wrexham's smile faded isabel had a nasty trick of wiping the smiles clean off the faces of those that loved her too much however when she saw that she had hurt her lover she was seized with compunction and began to make amends i say wrexham what is that funny little windmill for at the foot of the hill she knew well enough what it was for before she asked but she also knew that lord wrexham would delight in explaining it his face brightened at once it is a new arrangement for pumping water up to the house you see isabel we have hitherto drunk the water from a well in the courtyard which did quite nicely for us but when i found that you were coming to live at vernacre i had it analysed and discovered that although there was nothing much amiss with it it was not quite so pure as the water from a spring at the foot of that hill so by means of a most ingenious arrangement the wind pumps all the drinking water for the house up from that one spring which i have proved is the purest water on the estate how good you are to me my dear old boy i want you to have the best of everything and i mean to give it you as far as i can but i should like to explain the mechanism of this arrangement to you isabel it is a most clever contrivance i think and repays examination so isabel listened patiently while her lover expounded to her how the wind turned the wheel which pumped the water up to the house so that much work was accomplished by means of a very little outlay you are so awfully clever at things of this kind she said as they strolled homewards i am sure you have literally more brains in your little finger than most men have in their stupid heads i have not many brains anywhere i am afraid but as i am always thinking about you and wondering what i can do for your comfort and pleasure i should indeed be a poor fool if i did not hit upon the right thing sometimes and lord wrexham sighed you very often hit upon the right thing i don't think you have any idea what a comfort you are to me wrexham when my head and heart are tired out they always come back to you as if you were a patent soothing syrup or a provision for old age i call you my rest cure i am thankful if i bring you any happiness my child in return for the abundant measure you have bestowed upon me in promising to be my wife yet i am but a dull companion for such a brilliant young creature as yourself however when you come to vernacre for good we will always have the house full of young people so that you will never have time to be bored by your slow old coach of a husband you are not a slow old coach cried isabel indignantly you are the best and dearest man in the whole world am i well it is heaven to me to hear you say so whether you really think it or not not that i mean you would ever say what you did not know to be true but you are sometimes carried away by your warm feelings to say things which exceed the convictions of your cooler moments i know i am replied isabel but i always try to be frank and truthful her lover smiled rather sadly my dear it is very noble of you to be so transparent and never to pretend you care more for me than you really do and my rational side commends and admires this uprightness but now and then i am weak enough to wish that you would let me deceive myself a little and, and not be so conscientious in your desire to enlighten me 
a fool's paradise may be a poor thing but it is better than no paradise at all isabel's eyes filled with tears oh wrexham how horrid i must have been to you never horrid to me isabel never anything but charming and fascinating and altogether delightful it is i who am to blame for being somewhat tiresome and exacting oh my dear do you think i don't know how dull and stupid i am and how tired you must sometimes feel of my society yet i am such an old fool that i like to pretend to myself that i am to you in some measure what you are to me though i know perfectly well all the time that such an idea is absurd and impossible in the extreme what is it in me that makes you like me so much asked isabel abruptly as they were watching the sun set behind the distant hills no special thing i love the whole of you and your faults as well as your virtues but don't you like me better in some moods than in others i don't think so i always love you just the same whatever you do or say you are you and that is enough for me but doesn't it make any difference when i am nasty to you persisted isabel it makes all the difference between happiness and misery but it does not make any difference in my love for you you are a good man wrexham my dear there is no goodness or badness in it i am simply made like that and i cannot help it nevertheless you are perfect whether it is your own doing or nature's if i were ten times better than i am i should still not be half good enough for you you'd always take my part whoever i quarrelled with wouldn't you coaxed isabel sticking a primrose she had just gathered into her lover's buttonhole always even if i were wrong exactly the same whether you were wrong or whether you were right the merits of the case would have no effect upon me isabel patted his arm now that is what i call real justice it is qualities such as this that make women love and respect men lord wrexham laughed and then said here we are at the peach house i want you to come and see some improvements i have just carried out in the stove which i think will ensure our getting twice as many peaches as we have ever had out of this house before whereupon his lordship plunged into a minute description of the methods whereby his peaches were to be prematurely ripened and isabel gave him her most satisfying attention when the walk was over isabel went to her own room and looked at herself in the glass miss carnaby she said you are not really a handsome woman and fate has given you far more than you deserve in exchange for a pretty wit and an indifferent face and a most admirable figure you will receive a coronet and twenty thousand a year with the best husband in the world thrown in as a prerequisite like a present of books with so many pounds of tea so the least you can do for the next forty years is to talk pleasantly and intelligently about windmills and peach houses and such like interesting subjects remembering that if you'd had your own foolish way you might instead have been living upon a few paltry hundreds of year with a jealous and bad-tempered young man who couldn't keep a civil tongue in his head for two days together for the rest of the easter recess isabel made herself specially charming to her host she was flattered and petted on all sides and he was the cause of it so she felt accordingly grateful the praise which is always accorded to the woman who doeth well to herself was hers in full measure just then and it put her in a good humour with herself and with her world she tried her utmost not to be bored when wrexham talked to her about the things in which he was interested and she succeeded in so far as she hid her boredom from everybody in the house except herself and him but clever as she was she was not quite clever enough for that End of chapter seventeen